Today we have an awesome malicious compliance story involving a coffee Karen. We'll get into that in a bit, but first, boss applies policy, employee gets mad, CEO rips employee a new one. Back in the early 2000s, I was working for a local council in New Zealand. If you're not aware, New Zealand has a central government and a series of local areas around cities or rural boundaries, each run by an elected mayor and council. The day-to-day -day business is, of course, done by employees in a typical business structure. One of the things about this is that all computer systems are regarded as being owned by the council and kind of sorted by the populace. If a member of the public wants to see what's on the computers, they can make a request under the Official Information Act and see pretty much anything except private data. Private data being defined by the Privacy Act as basically names, addresses, birth dates, phone numbers, etc. Also working in the council offices was a small business that had an exclusive contract with the council. This group handled the more physical aspects of the council systems, maintenance of roads, sewer and water systems, etc. If the council said, we need a new pipe there, this small business made it happen. Thing is, the small business leased, this is important, their computers from the council. The small IT team, three people including me, built and supplied those machines. We owned the software that was on them, and they were connected to the internal council network. This meant they were subject to the same local government and council policies as the rest of us. Periodically, we and IT would clean out large files early 2000s when storage was expensive and we were limited due to budget etc now the staff are fully aware of this and knew to keep personal files to a minimum if we during a purge found large personal files we could delete them at our discretion during this time we found some videos on a small business employee's machine it was adult entertainment and not the nice kind either the words fecal and mouth apply because this violated council policy in oh so many ways, we deleted it quietly. The employee in question complained, claiming we had removed personal files. I never saw the videos happily, but my understanding is that he wasn't in them. They were stuff he had downloaded. We pointed at the policy. He went to the CEO and complained. The CEO came to us. My boss had figured this might happen. The employee in question was an interesting guy and showed the CEO one of the videos, which was on the backups, just in case we deleted something we shouldn't and had to restore it. We were good enough at our jobs that we never had to do that, but better safe than sorry. I wasn't there when it happened, but by all accounts, the CEO hauled the employee and the employee's boss, boss of the small business, to an out of hearing location and ripped them a new one. The only reason the employee wasn't fired was because he technically worked for the small business and not the council. FYI, we would regularly block adult entertainment sites, but being the early 2000s, new ones popped up all the time. Unless an employee tried to access them, we probably didn't know they existed. It's not that we were prudes, it's just that most staff weren't stupid enough to browse that stuff at work. Anybody that views that stuff at work, regardless of whether it's for a governmental agency or a small business, probably deserve to lose their jobs regardless, don't they? Also, hi, I'm Steven, and if you enjoy awesome stories of malicious compliance, why not hit those like and subscribe buttons down below? That said, our next story is the accidental malicious compliance against world expert. This occurred back in the 70s, and before I start, I want to emphasize I was never stupid enough and will never be stupid enough to use my hidden talent. Background: I was taking an elective criminal forensic CSI stuff night course at a local community college. The best part about taking this course was the instructor, which meant an in-depth tour at the US criminal forensic lab where he worked as the questioned document examiner, i.e. handwriting analysis, signature matching, etc. Also, since computers were barely introduced into forensics at this time, all handwriting analysis and matching was done by hand, and this instructor was one of, if not the best, in the world. The malicious compliance, as good as I remember. It was a great course studying many facets of criminal forensics and taking the amazing lab tour. As the course was coming to the end, the questioned document facet approached. The instructor's specialty. At the end of the class, just before it started, the instructor wrote a paragraph on the board and we each had two sheets of blank lined paper. He told us to write the paragraph, only the paragraph, 
any way we want on one sheet and then again on the other sheet, trying to disguise our handwriting. You are committing forgery. The instructor left and we all started writing. When done, one student, not me, collected all the sheets, mixed them up and took them to the instructor. We all looked forward to the next class where the instructor would present matched sheets and then explain to us why our forgery attempts failed and how he would testify in court to prove it. Because I wanted to go home, I made it easy on myself. For my forgery attempt, I wrote the paragraph in print on one sheet and in cursive on the other sheet, even though we were told that is a failed way to disguise handwriting. Now, for a little background on my handwriting, it's bad. I mean, really bad. And I've held pencils and pens wrong since I've learned to write. The easiest way to explain it is I write with a closed fist, right-handed. In elementary school, my parents hired a tutor to try and teach me to write again from scratch including putting plastic things on pencils to make my preferred grip uncomfortable, it failed miserably. In high school, I had a teacher tell me I would amount to nothing because I had issues writing legibly. Basically, my print is somewhat legible and my cursive, good luck. But that should make no difference. Now back to the story. At the beginning of the next class, the normal, happy-go-lucky instructor looked very upset as he walked in. The first words out of his mouth was if anyone played a practical joke on him, he did not appreciate it. The whole class, around 15 students, looked at each other totally confused. The instructor then again tried to get someone to confess, but we all continued to look confused. The instructor calmed down a little and decided to continue with the class as he would normally have done so. From the stack of papers he was handed at the end of the last class, he picked out the top two sheets and said, in court speak, how he deduced that the same person wrote both paragraphs. Then a student would admit it was their failed forgery attempt, and the instructor would continue with the next two sheets. When there were just two sheets left, the instructor lifted them up for all the class to see. Looking straight at me, he said, he could not testify in court, saying the same person wrote both paragraphs. With a scared look on my face, I said both sheets were mine and I wrote both paragraphs. So in front of the instructor and the whole class, I again wrote the paragraph, once in print and once in cursive. The instructor walked away shaking his head and mumbling something like he had never seen this before. After that, the instructor looked at and spoke to me differently as my classmates created some obvious nicknames for me. For example, The Forger. I got an A in the class and was very happy when it ended. Trying to anticipate some questions, exactly why I could do this, I have no idea. I figured if I was in school today, I would be diagnosed with some minor learning disability. No, I cannot demonstrate this now. I've not written cursive in 40 plus years and too old to relearn. Cursive, think bloopy letters all connected together, which thankfully is being forgotten. I did make a new account for this post, and in the 80s, I found a career that matched my handwriting skills, computers. First of all, as somebody who's always found it a pain to write a lengthy amount of text, I definitely personally appreciate the shift towards keyboards and typing things and actually just being able to print something up, type it up, and either just send a PDF or a Word document or something. Besides like signatures, what's the point of cursive nowadays anyways? Our next story is buy a new one or go home. I used to work at Sonic as a car hop. I usually worked 4 or 5 to close. One day I was cleaning up all the drinks the day shift left around and I found a can of Monster. I grabbed it and walked around and asked everybody who was working. The manager, Robert, like normal, was talking to his girlfriend on the phone, assuming based off all the inappropriate talk. When I asked if it was his, he looked right at me, shook his head and turned away without saying anything. After I finished asking everybody else, I dumped it out and threw it away. 30 to 45 minutes later, he comes up front and went to throw away his trash and saw it in the trash. He was livid. He started screaming, grabbed it out of the trash and started shoving it in people's face asking if they threw it away. I told them they didn't. I did. He cornered me against the wall and screamed in my face that I was going to leave and go buy him a new one. Two things, the monster was probably half full, if that, and I hate being yelled at, and I asked him. We got into this huge fight about it, him demanding I replace it, me telling him to freak off. This went on for two hours. It was slow because it was winter, so we sent everybody else home, he was cooking. 
Finally, he told me I was either going to go buy a new one or I was going to go home. It was 7 at this point. We closed at midnight. I grabbed my stuff and went and clocked out. He said if I didn't go get him a new drink, I was fired. I said okay, see you never. Not even 5 minutes after I left, the GM Jeremy called me asking why I left. He said the other manager can't fire me as only the GM can and asked me to go back and finish the shift. I told him I couldn't do that with Robert yelling in my face like that so that I'd go back tomorrow. So Robert was screwed the rest of the night. Nobody else, not even Jeremy, would come in. He had to cook and run orders for 5 hours by himself. Pissed a lot of customers off. And when I went in the next night, he asked why I was back since he fired me. And it was a joy to tell him he couldn't do that. He held a grudge for three whole months. I just feel bad working there with somebody who clearly despises you and is just going to give you crap every step of the way. Our next story is, you want me to speed run the game so you have someone to talk to? Fine. I, 25 year old female, have a friend, 25, who's been wanting me to play Breath of the Wild for years now. It's not that I'm not interested in playing. Heck, I bought the game ages ago. I've just been more invested in other things. After 5 or so years, I finally cracked down to play it and absolutely love it. My friend is equally excited and can't wait for me to get to their favorite parts. No, literally they can't wait. Almost daily, I'm hounded with DMs asking how I like the game. Did I meet A yet? Have I done B yet? Have I finished C quest? Why is it taking so long for me to finish C quest? I prefer taking things on my own time. With a game of this scale, I want to take my sweet time exploring and finding things as I go. I feel like I'm progressing the plot at a decent pace, 50 hours into a game that other people have spent 300 on, and I'm doing fun side quests. Also, I have other hobbies and I've been playing the game along with the other things going on in my life. I've filled them as such, and they're not very happy about it. At first, they were supportive, if not a little pushy for me to play the game. When I would talk about certain plot points and gameplay that I enjoyed, they'd brush off my gushing and say things along the lines of, Oh, you haven't seen anything yet. You're not ready. Keep going. As I juggled between the game's two main missions, they pushed me to do one over the other because it's where the good stuff happens. Despite me saying multiple times that I wanted to go at my own pace and do both missions together. They hounded me with more messages about how I wasn't playing right and I need plot. I talked to them about it probably dozens of times. And they explained that they were so pushy because they needed someone else to talk to about the game. No, they wouldn't stop hounding me. I needed to keep going. For them. For our friendship. I'd thank them later. Speed run. So I thought, to heck with it. They want me to speed run, then I'll speed run. I used guides and read up things to finish the game as quickly as I could. I honestly have no clue what I did or how I finished, but I did. I eventually sent them a screen cap of my finished game file and gave them my honest opinion. I hated it. There was no build up to anything. I didn't know any character well enough to be invested in their struggles, and the puzzles ranged from stupidly easy to unnecessarily complicated. That part of the game they couldn't wait for me to find? Skipped over the dialogue. It wasn't worth the extra time. After all, I needed to finish the game as soon as possible, right? Needless to say, we're not friends anymore. Now that I've returned to my original save file and am playing how I want, I can say that Breath of the Wild is one of the best games I've played. Since I skipped over so much for the sake of being petty, a lot of things still feel like new. I have no shortage of other friends to talk about the game with, and thankfully, these ones encourage me to take my time. They can't wait for me to get to their favorite parts. But not literally. They'll wait however long it takes me. I haven't personally played Breath of the Wild, but I can tell just from the things I've seen and heard. It's a beautiful game, and especially the sequel now. I've seen some like gameplay trailers of Tears of the Kingdom, and even that looks incredible as well. I don't blame this guy for being excited, you know they want to talk about it, but don't rush and ruin somebody else's experience. Our next story is Coffee Karen. Dear daughter, 15, works casual at a kids recreation center and only just started behind the kiosk counter. Enter a mum Karen who orders a coffee, $4.40, and wants to pay by card. Dear daughter apologizes and explains minimum card payment is $5 and she can either pay by cash or can buy something extra to take it up to $5. 
Karen gets angry and demanding, saying this has never happened before, and insists she's paid by card a hundred times before. Eventually, Karen demands to see the manager. Enter the manager who takes over the transaction and cops the wrath of Karen. Manager swipes the card and hands over the freshly brewed coffee. Karen, having won, walks off with a crap-eating grin and a snarky comment of, You ought to train your staff better. Dear daughter quietly turns to her manager and inquires if it's okay to charge less than $5 to a card. They said, nah, I charged her $5 for her coffee. She does it all the time, but I just overcharge her every time, but she thinks she's won. Miss 15 never felt so satisfied ever. If they're not one to complain, charge them that way overpriced price for that coffee. I think honestly she earned that tax just for being so unsavorable to work with. Plus, I feel like a kid's recreation center can always use a few extra dollars. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another awesome malicious compliance story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.